Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Hello, everybody. This is Marco Ciappelli. Welcome to another episode of the Redefining Society podcast on ITSP Magazine, where we talk about cybersecurity, technology, society, and this show in particular. We kind of not touch much on cybersecurity, but we do talk about the way that we can live better in our society. And sometimes it's about cultural changes that we always need to keep doing as technology change, society change. It's a river that doesn't does never look the same. Yep. And you don't ever, as they say, uh, dive into the same river twice because it's different. So to do that today, uh, we're actually going to talk about leadership, about uh, company and how they can uh, make important cultural changes to become, uh, let's say, better company. And we will define what actually better means. And to do that, we got uh, Steve Spear here for people watching. You can already see him with a stack of book because he wrote a few books <laughs> in his life. And for those listening, trust me, uh, there are books and that's what we're going to talk about it. In particular, the one that is coming up soon on November 21st, which is named Wiring the Winning Organization. And um, we're going to talk about that. So who is Steve? Welcome to the show. Who are you? Oh, yeah. Hey, Marco. Thanks very much. So uh, just by quick institutional affiliation. Uh, so I'm a senior lecturer over at MIT mm -hmm. in the, uh, the Sloan School of Management. I've been there. Uh, it's uh, approaching 20 years, I think. Um, founder of a uh, software firm that does uh, business process mapping and that sort of thing. It's called C2Solve. And that draws directly on uh, research I've done over uh, the many years. And um, doing a bunch of other things. Uh, I spend a lot of time um, in the field though, working with clients and it's been across a fairly broad range of sectors over the many years. Um, currently doing a tremendous amount of work with uh, US military, uh, Navy in a different bunch of ways. I've worked with uh, uh, folks in the US Army, something called the Rapid Equipping Force about a decade ago. I've worked with um, pharmaceutical uh, companies, healthcare providers, um, educational institutions, uh, highlight of my career in terms of what we accomplished was working with a um, a women's center and shelter in Pittsburgh. Their uh, key product was a victim abuse hotline. Um, so anyway, yeah, I spend a lot of time in the field. Long and short though, uh, what motivates all this is that um, I came of a uh, professional age in the 1980s when uh, Japanese companies like Toyota, like Sony, et cetera, were throwing a really big existential threat at American companies. You know, one story companies, US Steel, Bethlehem Steel, RCA, GM, Ford, et cetera. Um, they just couldn't keep pace hmm. with uh, the ability of Japanese organizations, certainly the standout ones, to generate and deliver value in, to society. This is a society really appreciated. And, um, you know, as part of a, a very large cohort of uh, then young professionals who were just so curious as to what was going on in Japan that all else equal, they were able to um, – generate and deliver so much more value so much more quickly with greater ease, greater agility, so on and so forth, than uh, was uh, being demonstrated by their American counterparts. So anyway, um, my career, you know, whatever the institutional affiliations are and where I've landed in terms of client contacts, it all comes back to this uh, paradoxical question, all else equal, why is it that some are so much better at generating and delivering value that's appreciated societally than their counterparts? Hmm. Very interesting. I'm a big fan of Japan, and and I, I was there last time a few months ago. And when wow. I came back, I did a kind of like one of those audible online lecture on the culture of Japan and why Japan is the way it is now. And there was actually a, a period, you know, after all the samurai and the Edo period, about the 80s and about yeah. how the 70s after the war, how this company progressed. And, and there was a mention about the way that it was empower, empowering every single worker in the company, even in the, you know, a Toyota, for example, in, the, in yep. the manufacturer, that was very revolutionary. So I don't know if you were referring to that, but it, it, it made me think about that and it made me think about 
company are made of people. Yeah. So I don't know if that throw you a, a lead here to go somewhere. Absolutely. So Marco, a couple of things, um, just as we get into this, uh, I've encountered this over the years that being the foundation for my research is with Toyota back in the 1990s, I get people saying, oh, well, you know, we don't make cars. It, it turns out making cars is about the hardest thing in the world to do. But be that as it may, um, there are other people who, if they weren't uh, part of that generation in the 80s, 90s, looking at Japan for lessons and inspiration, they might say, well, what can we learn from Japan today? So I just want to uh, point this out just for your listeners who may be dismissive because, you know, you know, each generation has its attention drawn this place or that place. And they, anything else that happened historically, you know, that must be like George Washington and the relevance <laughs> of powdered wigs. But um, for, for what it's worth, um, at least for autos, let me just offer that uh, Toyota, as an example, they've dominated their sector for 50 years, the five, zero, five decades. And you start thinking about that. That just shouldn't be the case, because as far as um, competitive sectors, the auto industry is arguably the most competitive sector in the world. Um, everyone is trying to uh, figure out the needs of the sa exactly the same um, populations. They have access to the same longstanding and novel uh, science and technology. They depend on the same vendors for raw materials. They uh, make and produce in the same places, so they have access to the same um, workforce and skill sets. And yet you have um, this one company which has, uh, you know, well-renowned on quality and productivity, but uh, time to market with new product, time to market new brands, time to market with uh, new technologies like hybrid, um, da 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 And you say, well, 50-year lead? That, that's insane. That's insane. You, just, you never see that in sports, right, because um, uh, of the intensity of the competition. So anyway, that's just as we start thinking this through for um, your listeners – um, I encourage them not to be dismissive of lessons from Toyota, even though, quote unquote, we don't make cars. The other thing is uh, there was a period where anything Japanese was just like, you know, I remember being a business student and uh, a course management of technology was one thing. But Japanese management of technology, whoa, the, the, the subscription, the enrollment in that class was like 5x, just the regular management of technology. Just threw the term Japanese in front of something and it was just like people mad dash to figure it out. I think now people have, um, with everything else going on in the world, whether it's Silicon Va Valley, China, you know, et cetera, um, they tend to forget about Japan. But the thing I want to offer is that uh, Japan is still rocking it. You know, so, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, first world economies and societies think about is the, uh, the gentrification, the ageification of their societies. And um, look at Japan their economic growth rate, despite all that, you know, despite all these older people, retirees, small families, boom, their growth rate last year was like 6%. They've, they've recovered from the COVID shutdowns, et cetera. So there's still a lot of really fascinating things going on in Japan. And though we're not paying as much attention there now as we did, let's say, 30 years ago, um, again, I encourage your younger listeners in particular uh, not to be dismissive. But um, anyway, to your point, and, and to, to your point about um, – you know, a real cultural shift. So I think Japan in general has um, a reputation for some real cultural traditionalism. And it, look, it's well earned, right? You can go to Tokyo, at least last time I was there, and you can still see um, women walking down the street in kimonos that were, you know, designed, you know, that basic design was, you know, hundreds of years ago. Where I lived in Tokyo, I lived around the block from my, um, a sumo stable, you know, and that, that's a, that's a sport and an art form and, uh, you know, a, a martial combat, which goes back hundreds of years. And you'd see these young men walking around with the, the sumo, um, hairstyle. So, uh, it, it's certainly a traditional society, but I'd like to also offer that in many ways, the very best organizations in, um, uh, in, um, Japan were quite, quite revolutionary. And the one in particular I'll mention is, is Toyota, where I've obviously got a long history and done a lot of work with them, about them, and a lot of familiarity, is that um, when you start looking at any system, and we'll carry this over to IT and cyber, right? Any system that human beings design is going to be imperfect. It just is, because you got the inherent complexity of the system, and you have the limited capacity of people to really understand what it is they do. I mean, we have all sorts of uh, well-documented it, um, 
limitations in terms of our ability to understand things that are complex, complex and dynamic and so on and so forth. And so you, you give that, plus the fact our science and technology and everything else is driving us in the direction of more complexity of things that are faster moving, right? So we're getting this cross pot of complexity and uh, uh, dynamicism. And so that would argue that uh, we're creating a world for ourselves which, which is less and less stable. And I think we actually experience that sometimes when we see, you know, the, the complexity of things, whether it's financial systems and the, um, the accelerated uh, dynamic pace, we, we, we start to realize just how unstable certain things are. But anyway, back to the countercultural thing. So folks at um, outstanding organizations like Toyota, they, they took this idea of dynamic complexity, which engineers and technicians, you know, they just assume it into the object in front of them. And um, the and, and anyway, you know, Marco. Just as an aside, uh, technicians um, and engineers, you know, I think are very respectful of the uh, the issues of instability associated with dynamic complexity. So, for example, a bunch of years ago, I was doing some work with an aerospace company. There happened to be a fighter jet sitting there, and I was like, "Damn, that's an amazing thing!" Because I was familiar with performance characteristics and its ability to twist and turn and agil agility and stealth and disappearing from radars, even if it was detected. And uh, I said to someone, I said, how does it pull that off? They said, well, you have to understand this uh, fifth generation fighter jet, it's inherently unstable aerodynamically. It's just the, the part of its agility in flight is because it doesn't have a, 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 an inclination to glide. It has an inclination to tumble. And so the engineering is to take advantage of this inclination to tumble and turn tumbling into agility. You know, flaw becomes feature. I say, well, I, th that's kind of wild, but how is it then that you can take off and land, right? If the thing is so in unstable. They say, well, you have to understand that um, in order to turn um, the flaw of instability into the feature of agility and stability when it's needed, the plane is making, get this number, a billion adjustments per second on its flight controls, power, et cetera, to maintain agility and stability rather than instability. So anyway, you start thinking about the basic thinking there is that this complex dynamic system was designed and built. And the people understood that if you just left it as it was, it would be complex, dynamic, and inherently unstable. It would self-destruct. So what was put on top of it was this tremendous um, sophisticated overlay of control, of feedback to detect when the thing was doing what was unintended, so you could give it that billion times a second nudge back in the right direction. Wow. All right. So, you know, and there's that's an airplane, but there's biological analogies, et cetera, et cetera, about building complex things where you have to make this huge investment in the control overlay to maintain agility, reliability, stability, and so on. Anyway, mm -hmm. taking that back to uh, this revolutionary ideas in management. So the folks at Toyota long ago realized that uh, dynamic complexity wasn't just a technical issue, it was a social issue. Then in order to do the hard work of um, developing cars, designing cars, manufacturing cars, shipping cars, and then not only the automobile, but the whole infrastructure around that, that is the work of many, 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 many minds. That is hardly the work of a, a person, a small group, or even a reasonably large group. It, it, it's, it's the work of an enormously large group, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people. And so what you're talking about is um, a wildly complex social system, an enterprise that's tasked with doing this work. And so uh, the folks at Toyota long ago said, dang, you know, we could design this and script this and write all the policies and procedures, et cetera. But it, it's never going to work. It's, it's like that fighter jet. It just, it's just inherently unstable. So what they do? They created a system, and I'll make mention, uh, I talk a lot about that in my, uh, my older book, The High Velocity Edge, which is very Toyota-centric. We talk about in this new book, Wiring the Winning Organization, we talk about this idea of amplification. It's one of the three mechanisms we identify, but amplification is the characteristic of having a system where problems are um, amplified early and often, so it's obvious that there's a situation that has to be corrected. Um, so anyway, what we realized with Toyota, and I didn't have that word back then, but this amplification idea is that they decided very early on that if you're going to try and do this uh, 
wildly ambitious and endeavor of creating enterprises that could deliver product into the marketplace, you have to respect the fact that the thing you design is inherently unstable, and so you have to be able to correct it. And so what's the manifestation of that is that in the Toyota environment, their uh, idea is that you design work with as much intensity and creativity and ingenuity as possible because you want to at least start your work with your best known approach. But that in the doing of work, there are tests built in to reveal early, often, immediately exactly where there's a problem, who it's affecting, and how it's manifesting itself. Well, so can, can I can I just get one thing so that I'm sure yeah. I get things re exactly the way you meant to deliver it, and maybe the audience as well. So you the this this metaphor of well example of the airplane, this complexity. Yeah. You start with uh, uh, the word coming my mind is adapt. Like is yeah. it is it constantly adapting and changing according to the situation? That's right. You're reflecting that into the working environment. So yes. you don't build something to be constantly the right. same, but you build something that you're wiring it so that it can constantly be up. All right, good. I got 100%. it. hundred percent. And and I think the reference back to the airplane is, is uh, perfect and much appreciated, right? Because that plane is deliberately designed to um, – be redirected, right? That's right. the that's the uh, the necessary agility, which gives that the power to do things that that's right. was gliding. It couldn't turn that fast. No, no. Part of its competitive advantage is the fact right. that wherever it is, it won't be there in a you know in a split second later. Right. And, and another thing, and, and then I let you go. It's like yeah. it, these. Now you're bringing the example of you know the plane, the the Toyota, the car company. But at the beginning, you said you work with a lot of different industries. So my assumption is that. You can apply this way of thinking about the organization to pretty much anything, yeah. any industry, right? That's right. So, Marco, um, you know, we pick uh, – well, let me just finish the, the story. This yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Story because I, I want to come back to your point. It's a much better one than the one I was making. Let me just uh, <laughs> close off the loose thread is that um, this whole idea, if we're designing complex dynamic things, we know they're inherently unstable – and what we have to do is make sure that we have this uh, this control overlay and not control like command control, you know, puppeteer, martinet kind of thing, but, you know, feedback loops. Yep. And um, it, it's through the feedback, through the dynamic feedback that we get stability and agility. So within the Toyota system, they came up with this idea that um, when someone goes to do their work, they start with the best known approach. It's sort of a script, the choreograph, whatever you want to call it. But in the act of doing the work, Tests are built in to re reveal immediately when and where the reality is disagreeing with the prediction, where there's a problem. And at the moment there's a problem, that there's a response to the problem to contain it and then investigate it and then resolve it so it doesn't recur. So mm -hmm. um, I think what often got lost when looking back at Toyota was um, this uh, – people, I think, got really absorbed by uh, tools and techniques and this and that. But they missed the, the social dynamic. And this, this is, you know, and, and Mark, you got me uh, triggered on doing this whole, you know, excited rant. But it's because you use the term revolutionary. And here's why I was like so excited by it. Mm -hmm. You start thinking about in an organization, who is the very first person to discover that something is happening? The reality is contradicting the prediction, the plan. It's the person doing the work. Yep. And very often in an organization, the person doing the work has the lowest social status, right? Um, and and we, we have it in English, at least, oh, so-and-so works for me, right? Um, and the higher you are, the more people you have, oh, working for you. But what, what, what the exemplar has realized is that the person doing the work, they're actually the only one touching the product, literally, metaphorically, whatever, the only one touching the product. And um, the experience they're having absolutely determines the success of the organization in delighting customers. Right. And so they set it up. And this is the revolutionary part. You know, it, it, in so many organizations, the person doing the direct work has low status. They have the lowest status in the organization. Oh, I want work for this person who works for this person who works for this person who works for the CEO. But in, in, in his example, our organization said, no, 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 no. We're going to flip that. We're going to completely invert the hierarchy. So that uh, the person doing the work, because they're the first person to recognize the aberration between what's expected, what's desired, and what's actually happened, 
they have not only the right, but the responsibility to call out the problem. And everybody else is defined as being in a supporting role and they have to respond. And in fact, and I'll just finish up this part of my rant is when I was having a talk with a, a guy who runs a, one of Toyota's plants, he had this funny gesture. Every time he spoke about leadership, his uh, hands came together with his palms touching and his feet, fingers spread out. Those who are watching the video, I'm making a, a, a V with my hands mm -hmm. pointing up. And I was trying to understand what, what was this tick he had? What was this gesture? And I realized it. For him, leadership is not top down telling, you know, the people who work mm -hmm. for me what to do. It's the people who are doing work who need support. And so the team member who's actually creating value through in engineering, design, production, whatever else it is, their quote unquote leader, their team leader is there. And there's the gesture, the, the, the V. So you're, you're putting a, a pyramid upside down. That's right. Where the weight is coming down and down and down to ultimately it's the, the globe on Atlas's shoulder. Right. Right. So um, now the, it, let, me, let me bring this back because you asked a great question about this whole wiring thing. So when Gene and I were coming up with a title for the book, you know, um, we were really focused on the construction, the design, the engineering of these elaborate systems, but these not technical systems, but these social technical systems. And uh, these social technical systems, which like any complex system, have many, many different pieces which have to mesh perfectly for the system as a whole to perform well. And then it dawned on us, is like when um, we design a technical system, we wire it to make sure that resources, which are in high con concentration in one place, can flow quickly, easily, effectively at the right time to the right place where they're in low concentration but needed. Right. So an electrical circuit does that. It takes charge from where it is to where it's needed. Plumbing, right? A plumbing is a circuit which takes a, a pressurized liquid or gas or whatever else it is and moves it to where that pressure and that, that liquid and that, that gas is actually needed. And we started thinking about what um, processes and procedures do in organizations. And we realized it's exactly the same thing, is that you have someone over here who has an idea, they have a capability, they have a capacity. There's somebody over here um, who is in need to be a beneficiary of that knowledge, that wisdom, that capacity, that capability. Sometimes it's a flow. Sometimes it's an intermingling, whatever it is. But you have to make a connection because in the absence of that connection, then the work can't get done well. And so as we started thinking through how to describe this overlay, this, uh, this overlay of processes and procedures and practices, et cetera, we said that's circuitry. That's mm -hmm. social circuitry as opposed to technological circuitry. So um, anyway, we, and like I said, like we found with the, um, the exemplars, their design and their management of this circuitry is just off the charts compared to anybody else. And that's why they have such, such great ability to deliver so much more value into society, all else equal. Does this include, uh, I'm assuming, some level of creativity, like leaving people not only empowered to be part of the success. So yeah. you don't have that Adam Smith situation where you're just doing their job and you don't even know why you're doing it. You're, you're, actually, yeah. you're actually showing them that they're part of the success, you're empowering them, but also you're suggesting them to be creative with solutions. Yeah, so uh, this ties back to the circuitry and uh, just the phenomenal. Yeah. yeah, that's what made me think about it. Yeah, actually. yeah. so... Um, so in the case of uh, the worst organizations, and I think we've all unfortunately had this problem, was we walk into a situation. And I apologize. Let me. Uh, I told you before the sun moves on me, and I think it just moves. So I, just I, I love the effect. That <laughs> yeah. Very, it's very like, cinematic. Well, yeah, <laughs> cinematic, right? Ne next, the monster comes and grabs me by the collar. <laughs> um, so uh, in the worst case, when the, the, the wiring is not of a winning organization, it's of a losing organization, um, People walk in, and I think we've had this experience where you walk into uh, a situation and say, all right, what am I supposed to do? And uh, a good part of your uh, ingenuity, your creative effort, is just trying to figure out what you're supposed to do. And then once you figure out what you're supposed to do, then the next part is like, oh, yeah, but the things I need, what do I need? And then you spend a lot of your ingenuity trying to figure that out. 
And then you figure out, oh, well, now that I know what I need, where do I even get it? And then there's all this, and you see this in large, uh, you know, you know, bureaucratic organizations. People spend so much time and so much energy just trying to figure out what to do and get it done that the actual social or technical problems in front of them, they don't have time and energy left over, right? And, 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 and that fosters this, this whole sense of uh, frustration and cynicism and being jaded. Now, to your point, when we have organizations that are actually wired to win as opposed to wired to lose, you have this connectivity between people who actually um, have to collaborate and have to collaborate in an often very creative fashion. But, and then when they walk into the situation, they're not walking into situations wondering, what am I supposed to do? Who do I depend on? Who's dependent on me? Where do I get my resources? They walk right in and all that because of the wiring is obvious and clean. And they can then take their ingenuity and rather have it dissipate into this ether of confusion, have it focused on the problem in front of them. And the problem in front of them in the singular, but also the, the problem in front of them in the plural, the collaborative plural. Which makes me think again to the, the power of reacting really quick and then That's maintain right. the stability, which is kind of like a paradox in a way, right? I mean, you, it's actually really stable because it is unstable. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, because the, it, it's, it's a stability comes from the, it's a dynamic process, not a structural uh, attribute. Wow, I love it. Let, yep. So we, I love the whole conversation. Uh, let, let's talk to finish this a uh, little bit about the book in terms of who did you have in mind yeah. when you were writing this book? Like who, who is for? So long and short, the book is for people who have responsibility for other people. And in particular, shaping the conditions in which those other people work. Uh, and in particular, beyond that, shaping the conditions in which other people work so that they can uh, better bring their ingenuity to bear on real problems rather than squandering the energy of their minds on all sorts of nonsensical things like, what am I supposed to do and where I fit in? Now, just unpacking that a little bit, the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the provocation for the book, the motivation is this paradox, which we see which is all else equal, you know, same market, same resources, da 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 same regulatory environment. There's those standout organizations which can just uh, generate and deliver so much more value to society than their peers. And the thing is, and I keep coming back to this all else equal, because if all else is equal, you can't say, well, oh, you know, Marco's got access to better suppliers and better vendors and better regulations because we're playing on the same level playing field. Mm -hmm. um, so the only thing left is the conditions you've created in which people work versus the conditions I've created in which people work. Now let's take that a step further, which is you think about why do we work collaboratively in the first place? It's because we're faced with uh, solving hard problems that we can't solve individually, right? You know, what is the appropriate design of uh, this medication? How do we actually manufacture it? How do you deliver it? How do we dose it? How do we make it accessible to patients? Um, how do we create software which is easy to use and yet delightful? I mean, all of these things start as problems that need solution. And yes, eventually there's the uh, some kind of uh, seemingly repetitive process that delivers the product or the service. But even that started as a problem, which is, is let, let, let's say you take a smartphone. How do you make the darn thing? Well, that was, no one had an answer. You had to figure it out, right? So anyway, we, we start with the, this, this paradoxical or this paradox provocation or provocative paradox of uh, huge disparities in performance. And then we kind of said, well, you know, the only difference between the best and the worst is the conditions they create for people to express their ingenuity both individually and uh, express their ingenuity collectively. And so the whole book is written around the idea of creating conditions in which the human mind can find fuller expression for its uh, potential than otherwise would be the case. And again, so the, the, the audience here is uh, for the person who's responsible for other people, who's responsible for creating those conditions in which the minds of those other people can find fuller expression. And um, so we work through in the book a set of mechanisms, what we call them, three mechanisms that make it easier for people to express their ingenuity versus not. And that, that becomes the theme of the book of how to, how to do those. Yeah. So it's, it, you mentioned a couple already. There's yeah. loification, 
simplification and amplification. Yes. Those are the three, the three yeah. main elements. That's a hundred percent. So, you know, when we were setting up the book and it's, it's right in the beginning, we say, look, if it, if management and leadership really is, uh, expressed by people's ability to create good conditions for the minds of other people, then what are bad conditions? And we call that in the book, the danger zone. And the danger zone is if you put a person in a situation where um, the problems they have to address are very, very complex, hard to do. The situation is fast moving, harder to do, hard to control, even harder to do. Risks and stakes are high, harder to do. Um, and then you make a situation where because it's a one-off, there's no opportunity to learn from experience or experimentation. Even worse, even worse. That's the danger zone. They say, well, what's the flip side of that? The winning zone. Well, the winning zone is all that, but opposite, right? So put people in situations with simpler problems, boom, it's easier for them to express their ingenuity. Make the environment slower moving so they can keep up with the environment rather than having to be like in a, in a trigger response behavior. Easier. Lower the stakes. Give opportunity for reputa uh, repetition. So anyway, the book we lay out that the, the ne necessary objective for managers slash leaders is to cha change the conditions in which people are working from this danger zone to this winning zone, danger zone for their minds and, and winning zone for, for their intellects. And then we go through a series of mechanisms, three of them to be particular, as you mentioned. So we have this idea of just slowing things down. And we call that, we made up a word, we call it slowification. Um, it, we, we had to make up a word. There's a German word which describes exactly what we mean, but like many German words, it's lots of letters, all consonants, hard to pronounce. So <laughs> you know, it's a little difficult. But what's the basic idea of slowification? It's that whatever problem is in front of a group of people, it's easier to solve the problem because the environment is less threatening. All right, mm -hmm. that's slowification. Then we have another, and we have a number of really great examples in there of where people have done that, have brought the problems out of the operating environment back into planning, practice, preparation, where the human mind can find better expression. The, the second mechanism we spend quite a bit of time talking about is simplification. And in contrast, if slowification is about changing the conditions in which we're solving problems, so the problem solving experience itself is easier, simplification is. How do we partition and otherwise break up problems, big problems into smaller pieces so the problems themselves are easier to solve? And we use terms like modularization, incrementalization, things like that, which all have to do with taking big, complex, highly intertwined, hard to fathom things and making them into smaller uh, pieces. And then the, uh, the third mechanism, and we've spent quite a bit of time on that, is this idea of amplification. Yeah. So if slowification is change the conditions so the problem solving is easier to do, and simplification is about changing the problem itself so it's easier to solve. Amplification is about making it much more obvious you have a problem on which you have to focus attention. Right. So those become the mechanisms we find as common across many, many different situations. Yeah. Well, Steve, it's uh, really fascinating, and I love the fact that without taking into consideration all these changes, technology, it, it really focuses on the humans. I think yeah. at the end you're going into the human I've seen in my head some reference and connection to the way nature works, synergy in general. So I think it's an excellent uh, concept, and I hope that people will jump on it. You, you know, you've been, you're a great storyteller. So I invite uh, everybody to uh, check out the book once to come out November 21st, yep. uh, Wiring the Winning Organization. Uh, with uh, Steven Spear, you wrote it, and you, the, the co-writer is... Um, Gene Kim. Gene Kim. That's right. And uh, for everybody to stay tuned, uh, subscribe to the show. We'll have many more conversations like this. And Steve, I really enjoyed it. If you want to come back anytime, you want to talk about something, I, I really, really enjoy. You know, New York, Italian, we can talk forever. Oh, so. forever. It's not <laughs> I mean, We just got started. I know. Uh, well, this is great. And I, first of all, I just want to say thank you for the chance to talk with you and, uh, you know, with your listeners. The other thing I just want to emphasize is uh, you, you make another good point is uh, the book is all about people. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I, I rattled off a bunch of examples. And in the book, we draw on a whole host of them, um, whether it's, uh, you know, space travel, medical care, responding to uh, mass casualty events, IT stuff, et cetera. And, and why is that? Is because regardless of the, um, the technology people are focusing their attention on, 
And regardless of the technology they use to focus on that technology, every organization has a commonality. And that is, it's collaborative work by many people trying to give full expression to their mind's potential to do things together they can't do alone. Yep. And, and once we realize that every organization has that commonality, then we sort of have to say that then every organization has to be managed and led in such a way that gives consideration for the strengths and the weaknesses of the human mind. And so, uh, you know, we're really quite excited that we've had a chance to observe and listen and learn and experience and otherwise draw on this tremendous set of inspirations to uh, come up with this uh, kind of unifying Venn diagram of these mechanisms that allow some organizations to win, whereas uh, without the mechanisms, they might lose. Love it. Love it. Great, uh, great conclusion to to the show, to the episode. One more uh thing to leave our audience to think. So you got that. All right. All right, everybody, we'll call this off. Stay tuned for another episode coming at you very soon from uh, the Finance Society podcast. Take care. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you learned something new and this story made you think, then share ITSP Magazine your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our columns. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.